Hi, everyone. Welcome to another book discussion between the Unerased Book Club and Ann Arbor District Library. Tonight, we are discussing a young adult book. It is called Seven Deadly Shadows, and this is co-authored by Courtney Alameda and Valian Matani. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right. Um, and before we get started, let's just briefly go around and introduce ourselves and give a for a visual description if you're comfortable. So I will start. I'm Lucy. I am a library tech here at Ann Arbor District Library. I work in youth programming, but I also do a lot for adults. Um, and I really enjoy these book discussions. I am a white woman in her early 50s. I'm wearing glasses. I have a long brown hair and I'm wearing a black sweater sitting in front of a yellow wall. I'm Emily. I am a librarian at Ann Arbor District Library. I um, work mainly with adults and programming, and I do uh, adult nonfiction. Um, I'm a white woman in my mid-30s. I have longish, wavy, reddish-brown hair. I am sitting in front of a mostly white wall with a print of Matisse's goldfish behind me, and I'm wearing a green sweater. I'm Christopher. I am a library technician at AADL. I do a lot of youth and adult programming, and I love to take advantage of unerased book discussions whenever I have the chance. I'm a white man with short black hair wearing a very busy shirt, uh, and the background is a bunch of books on a wall. Hi, everyone. I'm Fatima. I am one of the co-facilitators of Unerased Book Club. I am a South Asian woman with long black hair, and today I'm wearing a navy blue button-down and a light blue blazer. Um, and behind me is uh, just some generic office space with some photographs on the wall. Cool. Thank you so much for having us again um, and for discussing this slightly horror, spooky read with us. Uh, and as always, uh, we want to hear, uh, what did you think of the book? I'll jump in. I have not read a ton of YA, but I thought in some ways, perhaps the book was maybe a kind of formulaic YA book. Um, and we can talk about that more, but I really appreciated the new setting. I particularly appreciated all the Japanese words that were thrown into the narrative without that much of an explanation, and you just have to go with it. And if you want, you can look at the glossary in the back, which I didn't do much at all as I was reading the book, because I just wanted to enjoy being immersed as as much as I could in the culture and the language. I agree, Christopher. I think what I got most out of the book as well was its setting and learning a little bit more. It inspired me to look into a little bit more about Shintoism, which I don't know a lot about. Uh, and I still say I don't know a lot about, but I'm learning more. Um, but as a story itself, I I struggled with connecting with characters, uh, and I don't know if part of that is I don't read a lot of YA either, but I know you're trying to do a lot more storytelling often in a shorter space. Uh, and so I think perhaps some of the time for character connection and development I missed. I'll also say that I listened to it. Um, it was the way that I was able to get it, uh, but I don't know that that was a good fit for me for this kind of book because... I don't know. I have a hard time with action scenes. Um, and so I would find myself when I was listening to it during the main action scenes, I'd realize I had stopped paying attention for a moment and kind of lost. And it was harder to then, you know, when you're reading and you realize you stopped paying attention, you just go back a few paragraphs and figure out where you left off. And that's a little harder to do on audio. So I think I also did not benefit myself uh, or benefit the book by the format that I ended up taking it in. I really agree with both of you. Um, I do read a lot of YA and I, um, I can see that there were a lot of tropes in this. And I don't know if that was like an intentional thing that um, they, they did, but I also really enjoyed like getting all the, the history and learning about Shintoism. And I like the sort of um, like the, 
Kitsune, the fox creatures. I think that's all really interesting. And, um, but like you, Emily, I struggled to connect with the characters. And I think it was maybe because it was so action packed, we didn't actually get very many moments of when they might have connected. You know, like, like in the beginning with Kira and Shiro, they are just sort of know each other for like they've made a connection, I guess, before the book starts. So we, I think we missed that a little bit. I also listened to some of it and had the same struggle. So then I went, I did have a copy where I read some of the action scenes because I realized with action scenes, I either need to see them or I need to read the words on the page. But if someone's just describing an action scene to me, I can't get like a um, a visual of, of place and movement. So I think a combination of both helped me a little bit. Yeah, I I would totally agree with all of you on that. It's particularly about the action scenes because I also listened to the audiobook um and uh, it was really really challenging because uh, uh, with the action scenes I would find myself tuning out or not following and then suddenly it's like there's blood and gore everywhere. I'm like, "Wait, where did that come from?" And so that was that was challenging for sure. Um and I also um, felt because of the reliance on a lot of typical tropes such as bullying, um, you know, the, the hero's arc that we saw with the uh, storyline, um, as well as some of the other other elements. I just uh, I think that because there was so much covered in such a short period of time, it was really, really hard to get that depth. There were a lot more things that I wish I had um known like for example uh kira's relationship with her mother i wish that we had just gotten more of that or um even shiro's relationship with his mother right um i don't think that there there's just so many little things that we could have benefited from for sure yeah um yeah, okay, I feel so, like some of the action. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. So some of the action could have been maybe replaced by those moments of learning about family details and and family history. It didn't occur to me till I finished reading it that it was based on the Seven Samurai. So I wonder, like, if that's it required having all of these pieces in it. But mm-hmm. I still felt like I like you found them. I just wanted more. There were certain storylines that were started. And I was like, oh, and then. You know, even like Kira with her siblings, I was kind of interested, like with her relationship mm-hmm. with her brother, but we just didn't hear much about that. So, exactly. Since you read so many, um, so much YA, um, mm-hmm. Lucy, I was curious whether you thought it was also formulaic to typical YA books. Yeah, I, I did think, I mean, I, I do think that there are a lot of recognizable tropes. I think that it felt a little bit like heavy handed in the, in the sense of like, um, you know, it is, it is Kira's like hero journey, but she also is constantly rescued by somebody like every, except until the end, like every single time it's like, you know, action scene, action scene, action scene, she's rescued. Okay. Next action scene. And so it felt like I could see recognizable tropes that I, I read in other YA, but I also felt like within the book itself, it was kind of like, it had taken a, a stamp, its own thing, and, and just kept doing that. Um, and I have read, you know, YA, where the characters, you do really do get a lot of character development. I just think this was a different book. This was a very action-driven book. And it was also written by two people. And I'm interested in their kind of co-writing process and how that, you know, came together. Um but yeah, I think it, did, it. You know, I got some sense that it was like other things I'd read. I definitely think like the the bullying, the girls being mean, Kara being the girl who's like, I don't care about wearing makeup. I'm not that. You know, um, the. But then it was very different because it also went into all this the stuff that was happening in the you know shrines and the Shintoism and the. Um, the other like fantasy parts of it. So it was sort of a mix. Um, Lucy. Oh, go ahead. 
uh, Lucy, you mentioned, you know, kind of what was happening during some of the action sequences, something that I saw over and over again in the book was uh, Kira would want to be brave or do something and Shiro would step in front of her. And that happened over and over and over again. And I know the author addressed that at the end of the book a little bit, but I kind of felt like he was just taking over all the time. And it was kind of an annoying character trait. Um, yeah, I and, some, and it started to get in the way of the characters for me. And I think even uh, several times in the book, they're just about to kiss and he grabs her face all the time. And that, uh, I don't know, it, it just seemed kind of forceful to me. I don't know. I, I really wasn't into his whole mannerism very much. I found I the was like five, five thwarted kisses. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. And it was one of those things where I was trying to think about like, okay, I have a very different perspective on romance as a 35 year old than I did as a 15 year old. And so trying to think like, would I have, would that have been something that I would have latched on to the almost kissing, but not quite. But even that, it just seemed like, all right, well, you already know he likes you. Isn't there, that's where the teen drama is, is more in the, the question of feelings than it is having the chance to actually kiss. I don't know. But I, I, that was one of the things where I felt like it almost felt like they the romance was just kind of put in there, like, oh, it's a teen book. We need to have a little bit of romance. Um, and I understand perhaps the authors not being particularly interested in writing it, um, but it felt like I think I would have enjoyed it more if either that was played up a little more or it wasn't there at all because it felt kind of taped on. Yeah, I didn't think that there was enough substance to warrant the romance necessarily. There just was not like enough of a hype um, the, or build up even. I was uh, I was very much struggling with that and wondering like, hmm, I don't know. Um, also, the, I, I'm having a hard time remembering the name um, of one of the characters, but I, th I almost was hoping this would lead to like a queer romance because uh, one of the... Uh, one of the, oh gosh, the Shin, is it the Shintos? They, um, she like there. There was a lot, a lot of like tension between like teasing or, um, you know, like oh, do you want me to leave the room as you're getting dressed or kind of thing or like would you, run? you know, I thought there was more chemistry there than this, and I feel like we just fell right into the Kira Shiro storyline without really giving it a proper proper go of it. Um, I was also thinking a lot about um, it, the Night Tigers author, Yang Zi Chu, who wrote The Ghost Bride. Um, and in The Ghost Bride, which is also like a very teen book, YA book, um, there were some excellent twists and turns that led to an unexpected romance blooming with a very satisfying ending. And so I know it's possible, but um, that didn't land here. And maybe, Lucy, this goes back to your point of like the call, them call authoring this book. In an interview with the authors, I read that um, they, one author wrote all the even chapters and the other author wrote all the odd chapters. And that they would like maybe have a conversation discussing the themes they wanted to cover, but then they would write separately. And then while Afterwards, they would exchange chapters and edit each other's chapters. And to me, that is bizarre. Like, to write a story in that manner where you're both simultaneously writing, but, yeah, like... <sighs> but that, that actually explains... Explain. Yeah, that explains something to me, because I did feel like sometimes the chapter would end and then the next one would pick up, like, a like someone would say to someone, I ended the story here. And then they're like, okay, my part of the story, you know, it, it has yeah. a little bit of that feeling to it, but that's interesting. 
Sorry, Emily, yeah. I jumped in there. And I think it also explains why it, it was more like action and plot based than character based. Mm -hmm. Because things like character development have to be such slow drips um, to be super meaningful. And I think that, you know, if you already knew that you were you were setting something up and then you just had to hand it over to someone else, I think that it is a lot easier to focus on plot that way. Mm -hmm. What an interesting way to go about writing. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't do it, but yeah. Um, I, I also thought that a lot of the writing read to me, I don't know if anyone watches anime, but it read like descriptive anime uh you know um tv shows or other things it's very much like that where the action sequence i could see it easily transferred to a anime film or tv show uh and i think that that was also the the pacing that i felt uh with each chapter it just every chapter kind of had its own like episode of the week arc to it yeah Similarly, in reading it, I found myself wishing it were a graphic novel. And I think mm. it is, again, like my struggle with action scenes in general. But when you when you have illustrations, that that changes that. Um, but I think I also, as not a big genre reader, I find that graphic novels are often my gateway into genre. And I think it is that it does some of the imagination lifting for you. Um, but I think this would be really interesting to read because pacing is different with that and so much character development can be just in how their expressions are illustrated i don't know i didn't think that i would come out of this saying i'd i'd like to have this story in another format and if it was i would consume it but i don't know if if they did a graphic adaptation i'd at least flip through mm -hmm. yeah i agree it would make a good graphic novel i think Yes, absolutely. I was surprised, even from the very beginning of the book, there's a lot more blood and gore than I anticipated in a maybe in a YA novel or really in any novel. Uh, I just don't often get that much gore uh, in my books. <laughs> but again, that probably goes with, you know, maybe the anime or certain mm -hmm. Japanese monsters or devils, you know, more than we're used to, more than I'm used to. Yeah, I, I would have to agree with that. I'm not used to reading gore too. But <laughs> did anyone feel scared? No. It wasn't a scary book. I actually thought it was quite a cozy read, despite the gore. I think you're right. Like there weren't, there weren't any moments where you were like startled or something jumped out. I don't know if that was intentional. Like I, I feel like maybe they were trying to make it, you feel startled, but I think that part of that maybe was because it became more easy to anticipate how the scenes were going to play out. Um, so maybe that's what made it less scary. I don't know. I think the only space where I've like viscerally felt in the book where I viscerally felt the 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 fear or maybe a little bit of the horror was when she falls into that well and there is like you know snake like tendon you know arms or the seaweed right like she describes that and to me that is terrifying like I don't go swimming in fresh water because I don't like the feel of plants under my feet like uh, no thank you um, so for me that was really connected and I wondered like what would have been what would this book have been like in terms of generating or relating to fear if the, if the goal was to scare people a little bit then perhaps connecting the writing back to things that people would typically experience, right? So not just like, I'm seeing blood everywhere, gruesome, but, you know, connecting to something else that they might find really, really scared of, you know. Yeah, yeah like I think the, the beginning, I mean, it starts off right away being pretty violent and I was not scared but i felt like i think that like when her grandfather is she's hearing him be killed like that mm -hmm. had a certain heightened kind of like 
emotion and factor of fear added to it. Um, so like, that's something, you know, and people probably couldn't relate with that exact scenario, but the idea of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm hearing this happen is probably mm-hmm. easier to make a connection with. Oddly enough, I think one of the creepiest parts for me was near the beginning when doesn't Kira have an encounter at the temple and then she feels in her pocket and there's that folded up paper fox. Mm. Uh, I thought that was really new and interesting and kind of creepy that, you know, these these demons can take the form of a little folded up paper fox I thought that was really cool and and kind of scary. I, I really like that. I think creepiness is maybe what I would have liked to have have more of in this book. Yeah, because the the violence, especially when you know, violence on screen when you're seeing it can be really visceral and scary. And in reading it. Not always, particularly if, you know, I I don't really care for that. So I let my brain filter it out a little bit. Um, But yeah, that that eerie feeling. Um, And I think some of the like descriptions of the weather and the setting had that atmospheric creepiness. But there were, yeah, more moments like you mentioned there, Christopher, with with the paper appearing would have been the kind of scare I would have been looking for. I'm curious to hear more about um, what you learned about Japanese culture and Shintoism, which some of you mentioned earlier on in the call. What were your thoughts? I think it made me think about the way um, the way that culture can sometimes really be othered. Like, I think if I had read this book when I was 15, um, it would have just been a Oh, isn't this silly? They, they're these these monsters and gods, and it wouldn't have been something that I would have thought of as something cultural and mm-hmm. something to be, I think, as someone who in life just tends to be pretty, pretty skeptical. Um, I think being reminded that something has cultural meaning is a great way for me to approach it open-mindedly. Uh, and so I appreciated that with this book of like, well, don't just think of this as monsters. Think of it as a piece of culture. Um, And so then be more along for the ride and not like, oh, well, this this is so unrealistic because it's not, first of all, it's in a book, it's not supposed to be realistic, but also recognizing that it has a deeper meaning than just the, the, the substance or the, the surface. Yeah, I was interested too that like um, you know, starting thinking from at the beginning of the book, um, I mean, I kind of right away I was into like Kira sees yokai. I'm like, okay, yeah, she sees dead people. That's kind of cool. Um, and I liked it was interesting to me that like the shrine and her her job at that shrine, that was like the most important thing to her and something that like was a a really really central to the way she identified herself and and it gave her this connection to her grandfather um, as opposed to like the complete opposite of what was going on in her school. And she would have, like you're saying, Emily, she would have been made fun of even in that environment that she was in, um, you know, by the people in her school. And this is getting away a little bit from the Shintoism, but I'm thinking that I did, I also, I really liked the way that um, this book was kind of always dealing with that dual world for her. Like she's, you know, trying to enlist these seven um, Shinigami into her, you know, quest, but then she's also like, I got to get my homework done. And, you know, I think that um, that's getting away from your question, but I I just, it's, it describes her a little bit more and that this one place where she knew so much about, um, the religion and the culture and the, I don't want to say folklore, but like the, you know, the the underworld and the, um, all these other realms, that was like the the thing that 
for her was was at her core. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's interesting how that, you know, she that was really important to her that she carried it on. And it was important to her grandfather. And it was interesting seeing that kind of next to how, at least throughout most of the book, how much it seemed that her parents didn't care and that they only cared about her reputation at school and how it made, how it reflected on their family that way. While she was concerned with more of the generational family and the taking care of the shrine and making sure that she carried on her grandfather's work and those ideas of kind of dual family reputations and whether it's a reputation to the public that they see, or is it the reputation to your ancestors? Um, we got, we got some of that. And that that's probably the bits of the book that I would have liked to see further stretched. I'd rather have a battle or two sacrificed for wrestling with the relationship you feel to your parents and to your grandparents and to the ancestors you never met and your role in that. And maybe the, the, you know, clearly her mother had, had tensions with that role, both for her daughter to play and maybe what she would do. Um, And we only got a little taste of that. And that would have been something that were the book written for me, I I would have wanted more of. Hmm. How about that scene where the grandmother is chastising <laughs> Kira? <laughs> I love that. I thought that I was... I like the grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> she was so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That entire scene where she's talking about, you know, like, oh, everybody's loving it. It's like watching a soap opera kind of thing. It just, I, I, I was like, yeah, if I were, it, you know, I, I would think about that too. <laughs> watched if I had to watch what was happening down on earth Um, yeah yeah I think for me in terms of like uh, I haven't read a lot of books set in Japan I think like most of my consumption has been around Japanese American cultures as opposed to Japanese folks and so I learned a lot about social etiquette in Japan including like expressions of feelings and in public and being so aware of the discomfort that you would cause to other people that you avoided self-expression. Um, and to me, that was the, that was so different from what I'm used to here in America, where, uh, where you know, the, we do express very freely what we are feeling, regardless of who else is around. And we are... Um, less mindful of that impact around other people. So I was thinking about that a lot and how I I found those little details to be so enriching um, for me and, and also just like a little nugget into what the rest of that, that culture and environment is like, I think. Yeah. Even the way the bullying kind of gets resolved through that very same process, right? Yeah. Yeah, that formal apology that, you know, she's forced to make. Yes, forced. Doesn't doesn't Kira remark during that apology that her father and I think the other father have a bow off? Does that ring a bell? I I think that was the scene. So it was kind of this critical, well, I took it as a a little bit of a critical view of this formal kind of apology, going Mm -hmm. through the motions and trying to outdo the other person with their humility. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little comment that slipped in there. Mm -hmm. You know what? Something I really, really want from this book is a wardrobe where you open it and it has decided. Like I've actually thought about that in my life. I'm like, couldn't it just be like there was like a like I had a bot or something that like just dressed me and it was the right thing. It was <laughs> what I wanted to wear. It felt comfortable and it looked good. And it's like I was I I love that. I want that. <laughs> yes. I love that little detail too. Mm-hmm. Another detail that I thought was super interesting was uh, the way time moved in depending on who, the interaction. So like a few hours in the spirit 
realm, I guess, could be days and days in the human space. Yeah. And I, and I noticed that's true in other, other books that are similar, like fantasy books like this, where there's always like that little slight time gap. I appreciated all the lavish descriptions of the kimonos and the colors and the um, now I just forgot the name of the the belt around a kimono. I think that was one of the words that they were using a lot. And and that was just kind of interesting to picture. I thought they were very vivid descriptions in all those scenes. And it kind of gave you a sense of this very grand presence of all of these people. Yeah, and there were so many different um, types of outfits that were worn depending on, you know, like what what the situation was. I found the glossary to be helpful there um, because it was just a good reminder. Of, oh, yeah, that's what that is. I did not know there was a glossary because of the audio version. <laughs> Yeah, the glossary was nice. Yeah. But I also appreciate that you had to do the work to look in the glossary. Like I I mm -hmm. I, I think that in general books flow better when we don't have the author stopping to define something for us, but I also think it's like it puts some responsibility on the reader to be like you got to, you know, this book is maybe not for everybody in the same way and so you're going to have to do a little work. But then I did appreciate that they had the glossary, so. Yeah. No, you're um, your comment just now actually made me realize that, that I've been kind of battling with this conundrum for quite some time. Like as a writer, I think a lot about how, um, you know, I don't always want to define words because it makes the assumption that my reader is not sharing my identities and, uh, and I don't always want to write for that reader. I want to write for uh, myself or people uh, who share my identities. But I think the glossary is just like a nice, nice like alternative to that where I can possibly do both, right? I can write for the reader that I am imagining, but also make it accessible to other people who are willing to do a little bit more of that work. Um, especially because I speak a dialect of Bengali that is not uh, written dialect. So, oh, there's not like a dictionary where people can go look up these words <laughs> and yeah, to I, find out. Yeah. I think that's such an advantage of the author provided glossary because I mm -hmm. very much understand like as a reader, especially as an adult reader, like we should be expected to do some of the work. Mm -hmm. um, and it you also remember something better when you, you do a little bit of work for it. But there are so many, so many words that have like meanings, but that the tone changes it or there's multiple options. And so I like, I like being able to have something that I know that I'm reading what the author intended in this. Mm -hmm. Um, I think about the glossary that was at the back of last month's pick, the dog eaters, and how I liked mm -hmm. that it was giving definitions, but it still had the voice of the author. Um, and that was a similar thing, um, sort of ch like how you said you were reading this, Christopher, where you knew the glossary was there and you sometimes went back, but sometimes you just kind of stayed with it and let it wash over you. Um, mm -hmm. And I did a similar thing with that. And I I liked it because then I, if I could get at something how it felt just by reading and not having to break the momentum, wonderful. And mm -hmm. if I found myself confused, then I had a place I could go to figure out what it meant. Um, so I, yeah, I think I wish I had known that there was a glossary. Not that I, again, I couldn't find a physical copy at the time I needed one. So I don't know how much I could have accessed <laughs> it, but it's, yeah, it's an, a kind tool that the authors gave their readers. Yeah. I also think as an author, for you to um, create that glossary, it's a, an opportunity for you to even add things that weren't necessarily in the book, like to flesh out a definition. Mm -hmm. I mean, her her glossary is is pretty comprehensive, and so it's like we're getting this whole other little, um, you know, it's like this little lesson basically, and mm -hmm. and it's 
kind of an interesting thought that like as an author, that's really your tool to do what you want with. And so you can impart as much wisdom. Um, but I do appreciate that things aren't defined. I always appreciate, like I, it, it never rings true or real to me when you're reading something and it's like, pause and let me define that, you know? Mm -hmm. I love this insight. This is so cool. <laughs> I'm appreciating glass rings in a whole new way. <laughs> I mean, you can really have fun with it, actually, if you think about it. So, Yeah, yeah you're really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm also a big fan of footnotes in stories, but that's a total aside. Yeah, I am too, especially when those are um, unique or funny or, or, yeah, add something um that's again a really good place to just sort of give a little bit extra yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we've covered a lot of ground everything from tropes to um learning about new japanese cultures to what we wish the book had done um or the kinds of things that we wished we could see in the book are there um are there other things about this read that you wanted to highlight or touch upon today? I think the only thing I have to say is that we were talking a little bit before the recording started and how we weren't sure how much we had to say about the book, but that these discussions always broaden, even when it's something that you know, struggle connecting to. And like, sure enough, here we are. We talked about it for longer than I thought we had things to say. And <laughs> as usual, I feel like I'm walking out of this with like more to think about and taking more from a book who's maybe reading experience I didn't like as much, but it feels worth the time when you get the, the context of discussion. So just a thank you for providing this. It always is great because it gets me reading outside my my norms and even when it's something that I don't go and immediately recommend to everyone I know I still feel like I get something personally out of it it's, it's really great so thanks oh, thank you yeah, yeah I totally I, agree with that yeah same. I'm like I wasn't sure how this was gonna go to be honest because I was like oh so much blood and gore like what do we talk about but I'm yeah I'm, yeah yeah. And I mean, I leave here and I'm like, I want to look at that glossary again, you know, and I would read a graphic novel. And it's like all these things just start, as you're saying, Emily, you're like, hmm, more to think about. So um, yeah. and that has happened every single one of these discussions. Cool. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I thank you all for giving us the space, as always. Um, it's such a such a delight. Um, and uh, next month, we are going to be reading Shark Dialogue, uh, Dialogues. Uh, and uh, I can't remember the name of the author, Kiana Davenport. Kiana Davenport. It um, involves myths. Um, and it's a epic about Polynesian Hawaiian family. So should be should be really cool. <laughs> so I hope uh, I get to get a chance to talk to you all next month. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. And um, thank you to everyone who watched our discussion. Yeah. See you next time. Take care. Thank you.